On this Sunday night, a province in crisis and the help on its way. Thousands of new cases in Ontario every day. Now health care workers from across Canada are headed to the epicenter of the country's pandemic. Canada's financial picture. Will the federal budget tackle child care and extend pandemic measures? Remembering the 22 people killed in one of the country's worst massacres. The unthinkable happened here. And Peloton warning. The danger to children with this popular fitness product. Global National with Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. We begin tonight with the dire situation in Ontario. The province is consistently reporting more than 4,000 new cases of COVID-19 every day. And there are a record 2,100 people in hospital. Now several provinces and territories are stepping up to help the doctors and nurses on the front lines. Our Ottawa correspondent Mike LeCouture has been combing through the details. Mike? Well, Robin, we were given details of this plan at a press conference late Sunday afternoon. The federal government will be sending health care workers and equipment to help Ontario as it continues to battle record-breaking COVID-19 case numbers. That help comes mainly in the form of nurses who work now at National Defence and Immigration Canada. They will be deployed to the greater Toronto area in particular. Now, some of them will help with rapid testing, while others will go right to the front lines in hospitals. Our government has offered to cover all of the costs and coordinate the movement of healthcare staff from other provinces to the front lines in Ontario, including using military aircraft to help deliver this help to Ontario. With COVID-19 burning like a wildfire across parts of Ontario, the federal government has also asked other provinces and territories if they can spare health care workers to come help. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says that he spoke to the premiers of the Atlantic provinces as well as the territories, seeing if they have any extra resources. Now, in a statement, a spokesperson for Ontario's health minister, Christine Elliott, told Global News they are grateful for the federal government's help, adding... Quote, we will continue to work with all levels of government and healthcare partners to protect the health and safety of Ontarians and combat this deadly virus. Now, all of the costs, as Minister LeBlanc just said, will be covered by the federal government. This particular pandemic spending won't be accounted for, though, tomorrow in the federal budget. But if you were looking for hints about what we might see in that budget, Federal Finance Minister Christian Freeland dro dropped one last dropped a hint last week at the Liberal Policy Convention. Maybe an epiphany, as you put it, on the importance of early learning and childcare. Hi, Erin. It's widely expected the Liberals will be laying the groundwork for a national childcare program. Freeland and economists have spoken about the importance of childcare in starting the she recovery of our economy. The impact of the pandemic has disproportionately affected women. It's just like a road or a bridge. If you were to cut off 30% of the roads and bridges in your provinces, you think you can reopen and everything's fine? No, you're going to have to do something about that part of the infrastructure. Childcare is critical social infrastructure. The government has said stimulus spending over the next three years will be between 70 and $100 billion as Canada emerges from the pandemic. The parliamentary budget officer pegs last year's deficit at $363 billion and next year's is estimated to be about one-third of that at $121 billion. Economists say once you get beyond the sticker shock, you need to see if that spending is putting Canada's financial future in a better position. As long as you can make uh, those those good investments, those targeted investments that would boost Canada's economic capacity. And that's the tough part. So that's what the government will have to carefully consider as it prioritizes its uh, spending plans. Part of that could mean pivoting towards a low carbon economy and other sectors of innovation. Are we going to focus on innovation that includes green, but also software, artificial intelligence, biotech, resilience, those aspects? So, will this budget lead to an election? Well, a new Ipsos poll done exclusively for Global News says 53% of Canadians don't feel it's necessary to go to the polls this year. And those people may get their wish. The NDP has already said it will not trigger an election during the pandemic. Robin? 
Mike Lecouture in Ottawa. Thanks, Mike. Back to the situation in Ontario. There is a fierce debate over how the province should get a handle on the pandemic. On Friday, the Ford government gave police more powers to stop people breaking stay-at-home orders. But health care advocates say the provincial government is missing the point. Catherine Ward reports. Words from Ontario's Solicitor General sent communities into a tailspin Friday. Police will have the authority to require any individual who is not in a place of residence to first provide their purpose for not being at home and provide their home address. Causing widespread condemnation from civil rights advocates who call the rules unconstitutional to police forces who publicly said they would not follow the government's orders. The directive was modified late Saturday and now reads, if a police officer or other provincial offenses officer has reason to suspect that you are participating in an organized public event or social gathering, they may require you to provide information to ensure you are complying with restrictions. A spokesperson told Global news these measures are meant to discourage gatherings and crowds that violate the province's stay-at-home order aimed at curbing the spread of COVID-19. And while the second version is more nuanced in its wording, advocates still question its intent. To me that language is not different enough and if anything uh, the harm has already been done. Many critics say they are worried placing a focus on the role of police could make matters worse. I'm not convinced um, that this change in wording will necessarily make people who are racialized, people who, who live in low-income areas feel any safer, especially when there tends to be more enforcement in these communities already. And might even have the opposite effect in helping fight COVID-19. Having police presence is just going to drive people, particularly marginalized and racialized people, into their homes, into more unsafe situations. It's going to worsen the trust that already exists and make it less likely that people will want to go out of their homes to get vaccinated. While the province maintains paid sick leave is a federal matter and it will not duplicate an existing program, the calls from experts are consistent when it comes to how to protect the most vulnerable. We need to do better. We need paid sick days. We need paid time off for vaccination and we need to, a total shift in how we're approaching COVID-19 in Ontario. A call science experts say they hope the government will take seriously. Catherine Ward, Global News, Toronto. The pandemic is derailing the federal government's ambitious plan to boost immigration over the next three years. There's already a backlog of applications that need to be processed. And for those who thought they were approved, they're still waiting to get in. As Mike Delay reports, it's put the program in limbo. It was last fall when Canada issued a confirmation of permanent residency, or COPR, to the Mishras. They saw it as the final piece to their immigration puzzle. They sold their house and car, lined up good-paying IT jobs in Toronto, and pulled seven-year-old Rishana out of school. She keeps on drawing a lot of pictures the way she imagines Canada. But just as they were about to leave India, they were told by Immigration Canada to stay put. That COPR only becomes a confirmation upon arriving in Canada. So they're now living in an Airbnb with no resolution in sight. We are getting sleepless nights. It's like um, uh, the mental trauma that we had been going through because uh, we are in a limbo. The Canadian federal government has pointed to immigration as essential for the country to recover economically from the pandemic. But the University of Waterloo's Michael Scuderud says that's a misleading argument, suggesting Canadian immigration is mostly about the needs of an evolving workforce. And the best evidence is, is that when you increase immigration levels in the middle of a recession, you don't get good outcomes because there's scarce jobs. I mean, it very clearly crowds workers out of jobs that are people that are already here um, that are jobless. We, we, we have record levels of joblessness right now. The pandemic certainly put the brakes on immigration due to tougher border restrictions. The number of new Canadians dipped by almost 50 percent from 2019 to 2020. Just this week, the federal government announced a program to expedite 90,000 applications from essential workers as part of its goal to bring in 1.2 million new immigrants over the next three years. We are definitely expecting a surge. And now I don't know how, how powerful and when that surge is going to happen. But there is a, a monumental, epic, pent-up demand for immigration services of every kind. And that, he says, will trigger a logjam of cases that could take months or even years to clear because Immigration Canada can only process so many cases in a day. They could hire more staff or relax the standards to enter the country, 
but experts say both those options are unlikely. And that means families like the Mishras will just have to wait indefinitely. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. Nova Scotia is remembering the lives lost in one of the worst mass murders in Canada. One year ago, the close-knit town of Portapik was terrorized when a killer posing as an RCMP officer went on a killing spree. In that 13-hour rampage, 22 people died. Today, their families and friends gathered to grieve. Ross Lord reports on a tragedy that remains surreal a year later. After a year of feeling angry and bewildered, Devastated Nova Scotia communities are using this dreaded anniversary to remember the victims while moving forward. Almost a thousand people running or walking in person and virtually to honor the lives lost. It's surreal. <laughs> it's like it, it felt surreal when it happened and it's still every time I come through this way, it's always, it's always hard. Jillian Arani is running her 12th marathon. She's wearing 22 hearts on her back. They're all the people we lost, so it's just uh, for them. There are widespread gestures of support. The woman receiving this hug is Jenny Kierstead. She helped organize memorial events while grieving the loss of her sister, Lisa McCulley. Constable Heidi Stevenson. In the spring becomes the rose. Many families are marking the occasion in private including Tyler and Kelly Blair. Tyler wants to believe he's doing a bit better than one year ago when his parents Greg and Jamie Blair were killed. I say better, it's not much better. No, because <laughs> it's always there. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's always... So, I don't know, maybe I'm not doing better. The same goes for Kelly, Greg Blair's sister. She's angry families have not been given more information about what led to the mass shootings and how the gunman was able to carry on with his rampage for 13 hours. Tyler and Kelly say they've received tremendous moral support. And Tyler says his two younger brothers, who were forced to hide out for hours with Lisa McCulley's two young children, are receiving therapy. It definitely helps because they do different sorts of counseling. They do with like horses and stuff. So that helps. Smiles don't come easily except for when the Blairs remember how Greg and Jamie lived their lives in the moment. We can fall in love in mysterious ways. Usually the life of the party, especially my old man. He was a, he was a wild one. <laughs> The mass killings touched everyone in Nova Scotia, where there are few degrees of separation. At a time when the pandemic makes it hard to assemble collectively, these efforts are a point of pride. In the environment of COVID that we're able to do this is very empowering. You know, no matter what it took to have to do it, to line up properly, to wear masks, to, you know, be aware of, you know, not being too close to people, we still did it. There were also new expressions of frustration, including a march to a local RCMP detachment. But more answers won't come until a public inquiry starts collecting evidence. And no date has been set yet for the start of those hearings. Robin. Ross Lord in Truro, Nova Scotia. Thanks, Ross. Coming up, Derek Chauvin's trial nears its end. Closing arguments will be made in the Derek Chauvin case tomorrow, and then it'll be up to a jury to determine if the former Minneapolis police officer should be convicted of murder or manslaughter in the death of George Floyd. The trial has delivered emotional witness testimony, along with expert opinions about police tactics and use of force. Jackson Prosco reports. Have you made a decision uh, today whether you intend to testify or whether you intend to invoke your Fifth Amendment privilege? Uh... I will invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege today. He declined to testify in his own defense. Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin will instead let the trial speak for itself. <laughs> oh my God. That included dozens of emotional witnesses. I heard George Floyd saying, I can't breathe, please get off of me. I can't breathe. Who saw George Floyd take his last breaths in the custody of Chauvin and three other officers. Officer Chauvin seemed very comfortable with the majority of his weight balanced on top of Mr. Floyd's neck. 
Character witnesses, like Floyd's girlfriend, spoke openly of his struggles with addiction. Was there a time when you thought he might be using again? Yes. <laughs> you swear or affirm? Perhaps most devastating for the defense, Chauvin's former boss, the Minneapolis police chief, who testified that Chauvin's actions went against police training. That in no way, shape, or form is anything that um, uh, is by policy. Expert after expert testified a lack of oxygen likely caused Floyd's death during the nine minutes and 29 seconds he was under Chauvin's knee, along with the failure to provide any first aid. Is there another name for death by oxygen deficiency? Asphyxia. The defense called far fewer witnesses. Their strategy, so doubt about the actual cause of death. It is frequently said and trained to police officers that a person can talk, it means they can breathe. Witnesses brought up Floyd's heart condition, drug use, and added speculation about carbon monoxide from the tailpipe of the police car. You put all of those together, it's very difficult to say which of those is the most accurate. So I would fall back to undetermined no, if um, we in can... this particular case. The jury will consider three potential charges, second-degree murder, third-degree murder, or second-degree manslaughter. Any decision to convict will have to be unanimous. No matter what happens to Chauvin, the trial will not bring about the end of the saga. The three other officers charged with aiding and abetting will be tried jointly in August. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Still ahead, Russia's military might. Can the U.S. halt the march toward Ukraine? There's a new Cold War between Russia and the United States. This week, the White House laid out sanctions against Russia. The Kremlin responded by saying it would expel 10 American diplomats. Now, in an attempt at diplomacy, Joe Biden wants to meet Vladimir Putin for a face-to-face -face summit. At the top of the agenda, Russia's military buildup on its border with Ukraine. As Redmond Shannon reports, there are fears Moscow is planning another invasion. The Russian military heading west. The Kremlin had said these movements were no one else's business. But this week, Russia's defense minister said troops were temporarily deployed to its western border in response to this. Defender Europe 21. A huge NATO exercise currently taking place in Eastern Europe. NATO and Ukraine are concerned Russia is on more than the defensive. Russian buildup is taking place not only along the border of Ukraine, but along the border of democratic world. The Ukrainian government says Russia has assembled 40,000 troops in Crimea, which Russia annexed from Ukraine in 2014, and another 40,000 near its eastern border, close to the Donbass region, which is partially controlled by Russian-backed separatists. Most likely reading of the situation is that it's a tactic of intimidation, both for Ukraine, but also for the new U.S. administration. A bargaining tool, perhaps, in a possible U.S.-Russia summit proposed on Tuesday by President Joe Biden. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky, who recently visited the front line, has said he wants to join NATO. Until Ukraine does so, Putin may have no real deterrent. He knows that the initial uh, stages of an offensive, which if he does launch it, um, will not be met with overwhelming force from the Ukrainian side. A lot of people are saying that Putin is just waiting for the ground to dry. The people on that ground, particularly in Donbass, could again be the real losers. They are just being, you know, used as the territory to stage further, you know, uh, effort to undermine Ukraine. More than 13,000 people have died in the conflict since 2014. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Up next, the deadly warning about a popular fitness machine. Many of you may have heard about Peloton. It's a popular brand of fitness machines. And tonight there's a warning about the company's treadmill. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission says it has received several reports of injuries and one death linked to the product. Jennifer Johnson has the details and a warning. Some of the video in this story is disturbing. 
The Consumer Product Safety Commission issued this disturbing video showing two small children playing on the Peloton Tread Plus. The young boy is sucked under the machine, which weighs over 204 kilograms. Luckily, he manages to wiggle out and escape. But after 39 incidents, including one death, the CPSC issued this statement. In light of multiple reports of children becoming entrapped, pinned and pulled under the rear roller of the product, CPSC urges consumers with children at home to stop using the product immediately. The agency is looking for cooperation from the popular treadmill producer to stop any further accidents. We have been in discussions with Peloton about a recall and a stop sale. Uh, they have not agreed to that at this point, but we hope that will change. In the meantime, we want to be sure to tell consumers about this issue. Peloton, come on, let's get this workout started. Peloton sales skyrocketed over 170% in the fourth quarter of 2020 as the pandemic forced gyms to close. The company said it was troubled by the CPSC warning and called it inaccurate and misleading. Peloton also said there's no reason to stop using the treadmill as long as all the warnings and safety instructions are followed. The model that we're talking about here is the Tread Plus, but it's been known as the Tread since 2018. So if you have the Tread model or the Tread Plus, it's the same model. We're advising you not to use that treadmill. Other consumer groups are backing the CPSC's decision. Stop using the Peloton Tread Plus if you have kids at home. Experts say with the treadmill costing over $4,000, Peloton needs to fix the problem. The CPSC says if the company doesn't agree to a voluntary recall, the agency may have to take Peloton to court, something that could take years to resolve. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. And that is Global National for this Sunday night. I'm Robin Gill. Tonight, your Canada is Laurentia Beach in Manitoba. We would love to see your corner of this country, so please keep sending your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thank you for watching. Donna Friesen will be back at the anchor desk tomorrow, and be sure to tune in to our special budget coverage. Good night.